Hello everyone, welcome to today's episode of The Osasu Show. Today we'll be analyzing the remarks of former President Goodluck Jonathan and other notable dignitaries who participated in the fourth edition of The Osasu Show Symposium. As captured in the keynote remarks of the former Deputy Governor of Nigeria Central Bank, Dr. Kingsley Moalu, the current orthodoxy about Africa's development must be challenged in order to draft and articulate new vision for the continent. He said that Africa may be emerging, but it is far from rising. He argued low inflation, high GDP growth, and high returns on investment have led to Africa's rising industry. But measured against global standards, Africa has failed to rise. With the tremendous contribution of Africa to the growth of other continents, the COVID-19 pandemic has exposed Africa's inadequacies in areas of developmental policies, economy, and its inclusive growth. The question begs, is it possible that rethinking Africa not only requires collaboration amongst African countries, but mandates the inclusion of youths and demands for the immediate electoral reforms of most of our electoral constitutions. The conversation continues after this short break. The conversation of Africa in becoming self-sufficient among community of nations all over the world has become crucial given the COVID-19 pandemic. At the fourth edition of the Osasu Show Symposium, the discourse of securing a better Africa where our potentials are fully harnessed and realized gave credence to the fact that Africa must rise and be restored to its place of dignity and prosperity. Speaking on the panel which focused on the peculiarities of leadership on the African continent, President Goodluck Ebele Jonathan, Nigeria's immediate past president, spoke about democracy, electoral reforms and the power of the people in rethinking Africa. I'm delighted to participate in this fourth edition of the Osasu Show Symposium. I believe this conversation is critical and relevant, especially considering the adjustment to the new normal. Of course, you recollect that since I left office, I've been involved in consolidating democracy across the continent of Africa. I've been leading a number of uh, election observation missions in countries that have elections. And this is a topic that is dear to me because the whole world wants development. African nations want development. And for you to develop as a nation, the governance structure is critical. Who manages the affairs of the states? Who manages the affairs of the nations? And in the democratic setting that these people are elected, it is very, very critical that you elect the right person. But the topic talks about democracy, electoral reforms, and power to the people. And let me start with power to the people. Because in a democracy, the power belongs to the people. And a democracy is a government that is participated by all the people, especially the citizens that are raised the age of voting in Nigeria 18 and most other countries. This is done through voting people to represent the people. So the power is in the people. And for the power to be in the people, that means that the ballot papers, the voters' card that the citizens use must be relevant. 
the voters cards must decide who wins an election at all levels. If you take the Nigerian scenario from the level of a councillor, local government chairman, a house of representative member, a house of rep uh, assembly member, and senate, governors, and president. These people must emerge through the ballot papers dictated by the voters' cards of the citizens. And any situation where the winners of this election are not brought up from the ballots, then of course it is not a democracy. You can at best say they are running what I describe as pseudo-democracy, but it's not a democracy. So we begin to ask ourselves, especially in Africa, our countries that conduct regular elections, democratic, there's this tendency for people to believe that elections determine what a democratic establishment is in nations. No. Periodic election is just a component of the practice of democracy. For elections to be democratic, that means that the outcome of the elections must depend on the ballot, not any other institution, not even the court. If the ballots don't decide who wins, then we are not practicing democracy. And if we allow a situation where people use force of arms, using talks that is well in Nigeria, to win the election, then we can't say we are practicing democracy. Elections must be free and fair and must be credible and must be seen to be credible. That is the tenets of democracy. And until we get to that point, you cannot even elect leaders that will listen to the people. President Jonathan went further to discuss on the issues of credible elections and its impact on leadership in Africa as a veritable tool in entrenching true democracy across the continent as well as electoral reform serving as a catalyst for moving African nations forward and progressive. Elections must be free and fair and must be credible and must be seen to be credible. That is the tenets of democracy and until we get to that point you cannot even elect leaders that will listen to the people. If somebody wins the election, say a governor wins the election, through some other means, other than the votes of the citizens of that state, how will he listen to the citizens? Because he knows that even in his next election, he will do the same thing, and he will continue to be a governor. But it is when our ballot papers matters then the people who are voting in to represent us in a democratic setting will do what we want them to do. Because if they don't do what we want them to do, the same ballot papers we use in voting them in, the same cards we use in voting them in, we will use to vote them out. In that case, when you are holding an elective office, you know that you represent the people and you will do what will please the people. How do we get there? That is the second leg, talk about electoral reforms. Most countries in Africa have been undergoing electoral reforms. But there are key things about electoral reforms that would really institutionalize democracy. One thing is that the reforms must talk about the electoral management bodies, the bodies that conduct elections. If you take the African setting, there are some countries that have independent parastatals 
that manage elections in Nigeria, we call it INEC, Independent National Electoral Commission. In some other countries in Africa, especially the Francophone countries, it's departments of government that manage the elections. In most cases, the Ministry of Territorial Administration that manages the election. But whether a department of government is managing the election directly or we set up an independent body that manages the elections, are they really independent? The key thing is independence, not in the name. You can call a, an institution of government, a parasitical of government, independent body. But if in practice they are not independent, then the name is false. So a department of government can actually conduct elections that will be free and fair. It's been done in a number of African countries, which I have also observed. So the key thing is, is that body independent of the influence of people, either in government or outside government? Are they doing the right thing? The people who are supposed to win the elections, are they winning the elections? And in countries where the process go through courts, are the courts also doing the right thing? Are they looking at the laws, the way they should look at the laws? Are the judges or justice influenced by people to take decisions that are quite against the citizens? In Nigeria, we've listened to so many judgments given by lower tribunals made up of judges and sometimes magistrates, appeal tribunals made up of appeal justices and, and the uh, Supreme Court uh, panels made up of justices of the Supreme Court. So it's not just about manipulating results on the voting day, but also when it passed through the judicial system how to take final decisions on these matters are critical. To me, if Africa especially will move forward, it's not just about routine conduct of elections. This year alone, in West Africa, made up of 15 states, we have five states that have elections. So in terms of regular elections, we are progressing. But are these elections credible? And they really represent a constitutional democratic setting is the issue. Regular elections, fine. But elections per se, it's not democracy. If the votes of the citizens don't count, then it's as good as military dictatorship. So for me, the reforms should first gear towards making the votes count and taking a critical examination about the way elections have been conducted across the continent from at least the ones I've observed. I've seen that the only thing that we must do to get there is through electronic voting. People may feel yes, people could manipulate the smart boys who can hack into the system and do all kinds of things, yes. But still, people still use the electronic system to move hundreds of millions of dollars across the world. So I still believe very sincerely that that is the way to go. Amidst the speculated, burgeoning population of young people in the African continent, youth were not left behind in discussing the integral role they play in rethinking and reshaping our trajectory in Africa. Popular entertainer and entrepreneur Bankule Wellington, fondly called Banky W, highlights the continued migration of brilliant and intelligent talent across different industries in Africa to European nations and what young people can do to better Africa. Because in the last few months, a good number of the most brilliant, intelligent, brightest and hopeful young minds that I've ever worked with in Nigeria have relocated abroad to Canada or several other countries. I've lost some of the most... Um, talented, resourceful, just the, the most brilliant people that I've ever come across. We've lost to greener pastures abroad. 
I'm talking about lawyers and IT professionals and entertainers and fashion designers and people in tech and in banking and brand managers and just people in all walks of life. We've lost them um, to greater pastures abroad. And I think that that's what today's conference is all about. Can we rethink Africa? Can we rethink our individual countries like Nigeria? Can we rethink our approach and try to make things a bit better? And so today I want to share three quick thoughts about how we can rethink Africa. The first one is belief. Now I don't mean to sound like a preacher, but I'd like to paraphrase one of my favorite scriptures by saying, where your treasure is, there your heart is also. So what that means to me is that Wherever you invest your treasure or a part of your treasure, then that's proof of where your heart is. So if our hearts are truly in Nigeria or Africa, then that's where our investments will be. And that's why I've had the journey that I've had in entertainment and now in, in the media agency space. We believed enough in our own talents and skills, and that's why we invested in floating a record label called EME, which is now a media agency, but we invested in that record label because we believed in my talent and in the talents of the other young people that I found, enough to put our money where our mouths were and where our hearts were. And that label has now given birth to some of Africa's brightest musical talents and artists and producers and engineers and people that work in the entertainment business. It's the same story in the movie side with Nollywood. We believed in our ability to tell stories, our own stories. And that's what has given birth to Nollywood and why Nollywood is making the strides that it's making and why films are doing the way that they're doing now. We still have a long way to go, but as we speak, Nollywood is the second highest employer of labor in Nigeria. Point two is care. Care enough about the state of things to be part of something that is bigger than yourself, that is bigger than your own personal chase for success. See, everywhere you turn in Nigeria and everywhere you turn in Africa, you will find problems one after another. Some of these problems have existed for decades, but it's not enough anymore for us to just point fingers and complain because talk is cheap and talk is easy. It's much more difficult to do something about what you see that is going wrong. So if you truly care about where we are as a country or where we are as a continent, then care enough to do something about it. The last point is just to try. Mark Twain once said that patriotism is loyalty to one's country all the time and loyalty to the government when it deserves it. I stumbled upon that quote many years ago and it has since informed many of my decisions and actions when it came to Nigeria. So whether it was by building businesses, protesting policies, or participating in politics, for me, it was always about attempting to be on the side of the people who want to make Nigeria better, want to make Africa better. And that's what I'd like to close with. I hope that I leave you with the dogged determination that in every aspect of your life and in every area of influence that you have, you will do your best to believe, to care, and to try. I hope you realize that in this continent with millions and millions of people, you are the answer to someone's prayer and you have the solution to someone's problem. I hope you recognize that you were created to do something special and specific. And I hope that you find out what that is and you never give up on it. That's been my story. And as I close, I hope I leave you determined to do as I did. May you find the joy in your journey and a reward in your reaching. May you never stop learning and as you do, never stop teaching. In life, in school, in work, in business, in your career, in visions and adventures, in the pursuit of purpose and in the rebuilding of our countries and our continents. Inevitably, you will find that you will win some and you will lose some. On some days, you'll find that you're falling and on other days, you'll find that you're flying. But until that fateful day when you discover that you are dying, I pray that you never stop trying. God bless Nigeria. God bless Africa. God bless us all. In further amplifying the voices of African youth, Chike Okaibu, one of Africa's youngest presidential candidates, speaking from Washington, D.C., enlightened youth on the enormous responsibility that lies in them in rebuilding Africa. Two years ago, last year, actually 2019, uh, I ran for office. And uh, there were many people who said, well, you know, why did you do it? You know, you, know, you knew you were going to lose. Why did you do it? And that was a question I got over and over and over again 
during the election and post-election. And uh, the simple truth, which of course I couldn't talk about during the campaign, was this. Um, our generation had, has a responsibility to our people, to Nigeria, to West Africa, to Africa, to the world. And we've watched as our futures have been squandered um, by the people who have gone before us, whom we hoped would prepare a nation for us to run with. Uh, so when I decided to run for office, it was um, to come understand that process. I told my friends, I said, we complain a lot about the conditions at home, about the state of affairs. But as young people, we hardly engage. So, what role do young people have in rethinking Africa? I was asked to talk about this, but instead I'm posing that as a question for you. What role do you have in restoring leadership, in restoring, you, you know, um, pride and integrity in our nation? in Africa? What is it that you need to do to get to the next level? Right? So these are questions. Everybody's going to give you advice on what to do. Everybody's going to tell you what they think you should do. But at the end of the day, my challenge to you is to ask yourself, because you know yourself better than any other person, is to ask yourself this. Why am I here? What is my purpose here? What have I been put here to do? And how do I start? Once you figure that out, it makes every other thing easier because now you know who to reach out to, to talk about what your passions are, to talk about what your interests are, to talk about what social impact you would love to have. And then they can help you, they can guide you, they can mentor you. But you must be able to pick up that mantle, that baton and say, Regardless of what others before me have done, I have a responsibility to myself, to my family, to my community, to my nation, to the continent, to humanity. I'll leave you with that. In routing off the youth panel on Rethinking Africa, South African entrepreneur Kyore Petse Kalaute Join the conversation highlighting the possibilities that comes with the new normal and how the youth of Africa can leverage these possibilities that the COVID-19 pandemic presents to us as a people. The global pandemic has taken away so much from us. It has taken away the old ways of doing things professionally and otherwise. But the new normal has brought with it new possibilities and new opportunities. Now, I believe that one of those opportunities is for the youth of Africa to break down the walls that have divided us historically and work towards building a new and better Africa. The youth of Africa are faced with mainly three challenges. Number one is corruption and elitism, which seeks to satisfy the politics of the stomach. Now, here in South Africa, we've had many scandals that came up recently where you'll find that the politically connected individuals have been awarded the contracts to supply PPE to the Department of Health. Number two is rules and regulations. That makes it very difficult for entrepreneurs and professionals alike to get into the professional spaces because of issues like compliance and qualifications. Now, the third one, which I think is critical of them all, it is the issue of the untapped an often ignored demographic dividend that we have in Africa. Now, the African demographic dividend consists mainly of the youth. Now, what we need to do is for Africa to create an economic environment that will allow the youth of Africa to partake in the economy from as early as possible and for as long as possible. This way, they are able to contribute meaning meaningfully to the economy of Africa and make sure that Africa is advanced to the next level.
Thus far, it appears the advancement of Africa hangs on the shoulder of its youths. It's a challenge, but an achievable one. This is a call to action for all African youths in the continent and outside of the continent. The time is now to rethink Africa. The conversation always continues after the show is over on your television screens. So do follow us on social media, at TOS TV Network, at Osasu Ignatian, at The Osasu Show, and at The Osasu Show Foundation on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. To read news on sustainable development and current affairs across the African continent, you can visit our website, www.tostvnetwork.com. I'll see you same time, same place here in our headquarters in Abuja next week. And until then, take very good care of yourself. God bless you. Mm -hmm.